Additional background section for the Blind Eagle, the Empire of the Theologian Union. At the close of the Second Age of Stife, the very heart of the Aphelian Imperium was suddenly and violently ripped out by the sudden and thunderous birth of the Starfather. The entire world was dragged into the warp and becalmed by legions of Angils. It became the Angil world of the Archangel Malkada, and reappeared as a world of thoughtless drones deep within the storm of the Emperor's wrath, many thousands of light years removed from its former location. This loss was a near fatal blow to the Aphelian Imperium. In one fell swoop, over half the sisters Thanatine the elite monastic military order which formed the elite core of the petty Imperium's colonial forces. As well as the Ecclesiarch and most of the Cardinals versed in St. Karamaz of the Martyrs' doctrines of the faith, enforced as the official faith in the Manic Realm, the Imperium's precarious administrative organization was compromised and rendered inoperative. Within 10 years of M51, the Aphelian Imperium had descended into anarchy, as the governor kings of the Thousand Strong Empire fought and bickered in bitter conflicts of succession between each other sometimes besieging their own fellow imperial worlds with their piffs planetary invasion forces and what ships they could spare. Though trade continued betwixt the realms, it was carried out with paranoid wariness, much revenue being expended on simply defending cargo fleets from attack during their long short warp jump journeys between the strongholds of each individualistic despot. Some governors were utterly unscrupulous, hiring outside human and alien mercenaries even Krieg Surf soldiers to overcome their rivals often entering into surprisingly disadvantageous alliances in order to assert their claim capital status for their own world, and desperately each tried to get their own candidates elected by the cardinals to become Ecclesiarch. This of course meant that the Aphelian Imperium was much weakened at this time, and many of the border worlds were sacked by opportunistic enemies, such as the carnivorous amphibious Scythian Empire, and the Vazinaran Imperium, with its carders of Sycon. Terrible soldiers recruited solely from the mounting Sicker population of that particular Imperium which was formed around an unstable warp rift known as the Khazid. It was at this point, after years of anarchy, that the Talon Imperium really began to take an increased interest in their troublesome neighbor. While the Aphelians had been laid low by the events of the Age of Strife, the Talon Emperors and their nobles ruling over their many thousands of worlds managed to endure the terrors which destroyed many of their weaker neighbors. Through a combination of cunning and logistical might, they fought off hundreds of major invasions during the first century of the Age of Dusk. The rise of the Vulcan Imperium was fortunately timed, its expansion drawing their hateful eyes of many of the worst and most powerful nations and races of the galaxy, including the twin behemoths of the Eastern and Western Chaos Imperiums. Thus, they were in a strong position to take advantage of the Aphelian Imperium, often of its former capital. It began under Emperor Alphonse Macrobi of Talon, in 132M52, during his campaigns of reconstruction in the northern fringes of the Aphelian Imperium. He besieged and took these worlds forcibly, but was incredibly merciful in his treatment of these worlds after their defeat. He permitted the terrified lords of the Hive Cities to buy their passage of retreat from the worlds, and he did not install massive colonization forces on the captured worlds, but instead sent preachers and supplies to help rebuild the smashed and in some cases starving populations of these worlds. Forced conversion was kept to a bare minimum, yet, Alphonse's assassination by one of the mysterious Heracles faction of ex-Temple assassins meant his campaigns were halted after only seven years. Nevertheless, the impression was made upon the Aphelian population at least in the outer worlds. In the 160s of M52, the governors of the outlying Aphelian worlds began to cooperate to a greater degree against the old guard of the inner world, who still looked inwards in despair of their lost capital world. They looked to the Talons to aid them in this task. They offered the Talon ruling aristocrats trading privileges and even lands and estates upon their worlds, in exchange with funding and weapons in order to face the inner world who maintained most of the Aphelian Imperium's manufacturing worlds and subordinate forge worlds. The men of fleet engagements, pitched planetary sieges and raids that ensued could fill a dozen history books themselves, but in the end, the core worlds were driven into a corner and forced to sue for a truce. The Therentine Guard who had expanded to a massive size during this period, as they were seen as the most theologically pure force in the secular conflict arbitrated the terms of the treaties. And there was a semblance of peace. Nevertheless, the Talon were now intrinsically involved in the diffuse and fractious politics of the Aphelian. Over the centuries, the two Imperiums began to merge, via dense trading corridors that though they took many years to traverse provide wealth and prosperity to the rulers and their magnates. At the Council of Thesabib, hundreds of Talon Orthodox, 
Ophelion Kazimerovite and Ascensionist Cardinals gathered to discuss the election of a new Ekelshiok to once more unite the faith of the true Imperio. The debate was not a success, and had to be called off after many of the lesser radical sects tried to set fire to the debate podiums. And the Ascensionists caused a planet-wide riot in which 400,000 acres of industrial sprawl became a mangled war zone as vast hordes of zealots and fanatics battled like insane animals. In the streets. Between 100M53-200M53, it was said that at any one time, five Ekelshioks and anti ekelshioks were in place on pontifical thrones from Talon itself to at one point a small mining colony in an unstable star system. Each claimed to be the true Ekelshiok. Despite this schism amidst the clergy, the worlds themselves became closer, and their cultures began to merge and develop. Fear of the outsider and the Xenos began to mutate into a creed of humanism absolutism, that is, the creed of human survival at all costs. Humanity must survive, and let everything else be damned. In 487 M53, Emperor Santago III of Talon crowned himself Lord Protector of the Imperial Mysteries. This strategically sidestepped the theological issues of the newborn superblock of Imperiums, and allowed him to justify his secular campaigns and to impose military tithes upon the worlds nominally under his thrall. Though the worlds of this Imperium were still bitter rivals for the most part, Santago could still launch his huge crusade to expand the realm in 568 M53. Gathering together a force of diverse colonial troops and mercenaries, held together by the Thrantine Orders, other growing religious warrior fraternities and sororities. And the iron will of the Emperor Santago himself, who went to war in one of the perishingly rare leviathan moving fortresses, though he died before even his first crusade could be completed due to the monumental distances involved, and the poor quality and pitfalls of astronomic and less warp travel his sons and grandsons managed, over the next hundred years, to swallow up a dozen other imperiums that bordered the Aphelian Talon Alliance, subsuming them into the great web of commerce and religious violence which codified the realm of imperial mystery. Also, during this period of expansion and conflict, a center of commerce built up around the ruins of a former star fortress known as Hana the Ravaged. Here, trade from across the sprawling realm came, and the ruler of the space station was often a key figure in wider decisions on tithes and tax and what could be imported. Santago's Xi had this fortress massively expanded with subsidiary stations and had asteroids towed into orbit with this expanding colossus of industry and trade. He then declared Hana the new capital of the realm of imperial mysteries and himself its governor even though he was on campaign for his entire life, and never once visited the fort himself, with little objection from the powerful nobles and governor lords of the Imperium, as it was relatively neutral. It would be a mistake to consider this realm of captured and consumed Imperiums to be a singular superpower that at that point. It was a huge area of space, covering a huge swathe of the southwest of the galactic plane. Such a realm could not be administered by government with such slow FTL capable vessels. And for much of the time huge sections of the empire were like lawless realms of border princes and robbing wolf packs of bandits. And squabbling governor lords vying for advantage or pressing assumed claims of heritage. Amidst this anarchy and misery, there was the undercurrent of a building popular faith, the Emperor of the Wasteland. There were no longer any survivors from the time before the Second Age of Strife, and no man had ever seen or heard of the Emperor's actions beyond vague recollections of priestly chroniclers, who had hastily scribbled down scripture from memory after the loss of all the written records of the Ministerum upon Ophelia. Thus, the image of the Emperor became horribly distorted. The vile concept of the corpse emperor merged with the creed of human survival at all costs, turning the emperor into some legendary undead figure of vengeance and pragmatic, who ruled a universe of broken worlds and failed systems, yet refused to relinquish them, like a jealous child. This creed was paradoxically both horribly cynical yet fervent in its prosecution and practices, a faith of nihilistic mania, where only suffering and miserable stubbornness could get one closer to your god. So what if his empire was of ashes and ruins it was still his, his ashes, his ruin. When a necrotic war plague ravaged the allied imperiums in M54, the tenuous hold of the Talon emperors was undone, and a power vacuum was soon created with their failure. The cardinal known as Ceylon was to be the very man to fill this void, his name would grow to be one whispered in or an utter terror by his subjects. This cardinal began his life as a mere clerk in one of the priestly houses of sanctioned invention, where he made friends easily and swiftly, due to his serpent's tongue and charming demeanor, all of which hid his great pathological personality and truly evil ambition. 
Through a series of coincidences and sinister ploys, he manipulated his way into the priesthood, worming his way right into the meat of the Ekelshiaki like a maggot in meat. He used his power and influence to place his friends into powerful offices and in particular patronized the work of his questionable disciple Denval. This man claimed to be a warp scientist, and made a major breakthrough in the method of warp travel. He found if one could torture sickers and witches sufficiently, and somehow captured and stored their torment and lingering death screams, one could power a ship through the warp at tremendous speed. Salon quickly seized upon this idea, taking it as his own and tying it into the natural distrust for sickers prevalent in the realm. He turned this process into a form of benevolent penance. The death of the sicker would purify both their soul, but also allow the emperor's children to spread to the very furthest reaches of space. He managed to acquire secular support from a number of prominent Talon Oldborn noble houses, as well as the favor of some of the radical factions who desired to build a stronger empire, under a powerful leader. As reward for his discovery, Salon was granted the position of Ekelshiot by his fellow cardinals. His exact theological leanings were always slightly in question, but the devious man could never be pinned down to a single definitive answer. And thus was elevated to the post without noticeable opposition. For the first time in a long time, there was only one Ekelshiok of this imperial. As the excruciator engines were being created and tested by the Forge Worlds under Val's watchful gaze, Salon subtly and smoothly began to undermine the central faiths of the Cardinals playing them off against each other, but avoided any responsibility himself by claiming he was merely arbitrating between wronged parties. As he sowed discord there, he discreetly promoted the more popular faith of the Emperor of the Wasteland. He stealthily inserted known rhetoric used by the Creed in his sermons and speeches. Just as the faith of the Imperium was becoming unified in religious wars and reform, the means to propagate this faith across the entire Imperium was finally completed and made widespread use of. His influence grew as the Imperium consolidated itself via the new cruel means of breaching the war. Eventually, with this greater unity there came a chance for a new Emperor to take over. Naturally, Salon manipulated the processes of selection and influence, until a candidate of his preference was selected. Salon made sure never to publicly claim leadership or secular power over the Imperium, but rather work behind the scenes. The Ferentine and his own spy network, known unofficially as the Aquila Men, discreetly carried out his orders and kept the various other armies and factions within the Empire under control. As a final demonstration of the new focus of human unity of purpose, the Emperor renamed the Empire the Theologian Union. By M55, the Theologian Union was the third largest human Imperium in the galaxy, able to hold its own in campaigns against the very largest of Empire. Initially, the Union struggled to maintain a strong focus. For the source of direct outside enemies to attack were few. They were engaged with semi-persistent wars with pirate nations, hybrid cults of strange aliens with bulging heads and snapping claws, and a large-scale siege of the world of Rockfall, where the race of feral greenskins had made a sudden and unheralded resurgence, smashing the industry of the planet almost annually. As the force of barbarians continually threw itself against its attackers with mindless vigor, getting stronger every time, as if feeding upon warfare itself for nourishment. However, Ekelsioc Salon the first found the perfect foe when Vulcan sent his envoys to the Theologian Union, bearing banners of compromise and hope. When the envoys refused to show fealty to the Ekelsioc the Emperor's representative, the Emperor cast the ambassadors out. Salon began to order the preachers of the Union to spread themselves amongst the people, and spread the word. There was no Primarch upon Armageddon, there couldn't be. They were dead. This Vulcan was a demon disguised as a Primarch, they claimed. And so it was that the blind men of the deluded realm of the Wasteland Emperor turned their hand ever against their own time. In their own way, these vainglorious zealots brought upon themselves the terrible events that marked the dusk of all things, in the final war of conclusion and defiance. Additional background Section 5 The War Race Tempered the Orc Risen In the opening years of the Second Age of Strife, the Orcs as a race battled their nemesis, the New Devourer, and in doing so were destroyed in that titanic struggle which raged across hundreds of sectors. Though they had not been aware of it, their actions had inadvertently saved the entire galaxy from the New Devourer. While their war had been futile, it had delayed the hybrid Tyranid Orc Menace, which eventually found itself drawn away to fight some unseen foe beyond the galaxy. In the midst of the horrors of the Strife Age, people dared to hope that perhaps the Orcs themselves were made extinct in this great conflagration. The audacity of hope is so easily quashed, for the Orcs yet lived, minute spores and fungal helixes were left behind on the millions of abandoned greenskin world. However, it would take many thousands of years before the spores could fully recover. 
and spread like a bacterial plague through the undergrowth and organic matter which flourished on their former world. One such planet was the world of Lex and Fiderick. The humans there had come from the nearby feudal technocracy known as Shunterbeeren, who had eagerly captured this nearby world, which was impossibly fecund and fertile. By M52, Lexin was a flourishing world of diverse environments maintained by the sterile crop science of the cybernetic humans who tended this veritable garden. However, the feudal hyperlords of the Shunterbeeren soon found their woods and forests infested with strange red beasts with ugly tusks and a belligerent attitude. This was intolerable, and long-limbed gamekeeper constructs cleansed the biomes of these beasts with gunshot and flame. This was a mistake. Smaller green creatures began to appear in the woods. They watched and scurried through the woods. Occasionally they would steal children or set fires, and stole massive quantities of metal sheeting and cut down sections of woods. Again, the long striding machines killed most of them, but not all. Those who were birthed afterwards filled in for their fallen, and the building of crude settlements began. Within the space of a decade, feral monstrous warbands were roaming across the planet, tranquil glass cities were smashed by the tread of hundreds of vast squiggoth beasts, and the crude firearms of their riders. Throughout the now infested woods, an ancient cry not heard in millennia rang out, Wirag. More and more powerful constructs were deployed on the surface of the shunters, with ever deadlier weapons, but this only speeded the advance of their foes. Soon they had to abandon their planet, they did not possess exterminate's grade weaponry however, and thus they could not prevent the feral orcs spread. This story reoccurred on dozens of sectors and systems across the galaxy, followed by hundreds upon hundreds after that. In particular feral orcs tended to thrive just on the cusp of the various inter-power struggles which were ongoing across the galaxy. There were veritable masses of feral orcs on the border with Grand Sicarium and the Cassas, as well as the unruly space between the Thexans and the TAU, and on the fringes of Maelstrom space. One of the Demiurge Brotherhoods the collective of Hashat even began to enslave feral orc bands for use in their schism against their rival brotherhoods. As the shattered galaxy had no singular authority to recognize this building force, every lesser faction assumed these were localized threats and barely contained them. However, these feral bands of barbarians were naught but the wisps of powdered snow before an avalanche. At the close of the 52nd millennium, there were signs across the galaxy. Feral orcs were driven into fits of prophetic madness, and witboys chanted and babbled insanely. Something churned up the warp, and the powers realigned, for they could sense what was coming back. The orcs were returning, but not simply orcs. It began on the planet of Galgareth, a rich mining world which had the protection of a coalition of miners innocent human enclaves. The year was 999 M52, and the world reported fearsome warp storms, the biggest seen since their records had begun in practice. Their records hadn't begun until M50, during its founding. It was then that they detected that a space hulk had translated into the system, a hulk known as Saint Jollipers Bane. Their managing governor director was not pleased. Hulks were dens where miners Zenas perhaps even an isolated gang of feral orcs had managed to survive in the warp upon the hulk and pirates infested the hideous amalgams of vessels and asteroids. He had experienced hulk drift while on another core wards world centuries before, and he disliked what they promised. The world's PDF and system ships would have to be diverted from guarding his planet from real threats, to mop up the degenerate scum that would surely be squatting within its haunted depths. So, reluctantly, he unleashed his large fleet to engage the Hulk on its brief incursion into his planet's local area. His fleet was composed of old mass-produced TAU cruisers ray fitted for human use, Vulcanian vessels traded with the rising human power, and even some antique Mars cruisers were amongst this diverse and lethal armada. On board the transport vessels, Krieg Surf soldiers, Crute and Freeman were hired on Galgareth ruling corporation's expense. Alongside a free company of Obsidian Falcon Estarts and as much of the local PDF forces he could afford to send in support. Eventually, the fleet reached the Hulk. Initial scans and intel gathered by the fleet showed that the Hulk was like nothing they had ever seen before. The Hulk was no longer merely a mass of weaponized ruins drifting through space. It was a warship. Uniform. Sturdy armor covered its colossal flanks, alongside thousands of rows of vast weapon batteries and gun emplacements. And jutting from its shark-like sides were great spurs and towers, from which it seemed an entire fleet was at dock. That was when the firing started, and communication was lost with Galgareth. The skies were aflame as the battle raged for almost three days. Ships were blown apart, or pulled open by tractor beams and high explosive ordnance, as well as more arcane and strange weaponry deployed by the new foe. 
Enemy soldiers were teleported directly into the stricken human vessels, and proceeded to massacre everyone with extreme efficiency. Barely a sonorous growl escaping the butcher's lips as they killed. Only a handful of vessels returned to the mining world, including the utterly mauled strike cruiser of the Obsidian Falcons. Their leader, Captain Aragius, immediately deployed one of his squads to the surface of Galgareth. The governor demanded to know what was attacking them. Was it Xenos, pirates, enemy marines, orcs? Aragius responded with a simple phrase. Those are not orcs. His squad attacked and broke into the treasure vaults of the world, securing their payment before deploying back to their cruiser. Aragius refused to stay and defend the world, because he wished to preserve his brothers. For the foe raid before them was too powerful and too numerous to defeat, not with such depleted resources. So, the Galgorathans waited and fortified their planet as the bulky, well-constructed warships of the enemy hurtled towards them. The kill cruisers and huge battleships of the enemy easily swatted away the system defense ships, and deployed their ground forces after a bombardment of all the centers of military resistance. City-scale factories were dropped directly upon the planet, and began to work as soon as they slammed to the ground with a thunderous rumble that resounded across the mountains themselves. The few pockets of resistance remaining were dealt with by hulking armored figures that deployed right at the heart of their battle lines. Stepping through warp portals with ease, they wielded weapons like bolters, but far more destructive, alongside strange weapons, such as a device which teleported not Gretchen, but miniature plasma warheads inside the bodies of their opponents. After barely two days, the planet was conquered, and those humans not slain in the bombardments were rounded up and used as slave labor in the mining districts. Which were expanded and enhanced by the mysterious foe, who deployed huge titan scale excavators and walking machines to heft out vast quantities of raw material for the hundreds of factories deployed by the orbital fiends. This was the galaxy's first taste of the new greenskin race. Ten hulks at least were reported with similar modifications, but that first hulk remained the largest of this new phenomenon. These creatures did not call themselves the orcs, but rather merely called themselves war, or at most the war of the croak. Few people have subsequently breached the armored hides of the war hulks, but it is claimed that the croaks are in fact the commanders and driving force behind this new breed of elite orc. It is theorized that these new creatures are in fact modified Gretchen or Grotz, altered to be tacticians and schemers beyond the ken of the larger breeds. It has to be noted that no smaller greenskins have been sighted within the battle hosts of the war, who manipulated them or remade these intelligent creatures remained unknown for many millennia, during the age of intertwining fates, but we shall get to that in due course. The warriors of the Croak were a distillation and perfection of previous orc concepts and natural abilities. Each warrior wore flexible powered armor, which captured the spores released by them and sealed them in flame-proof canister inside the suits. These canisters were collected after a battle, and were taken to their manufacturing shops or their hulks, and dozens more generations of orcs were thus spawned. All the spores were carefully cultured and spread upon worlds deemed perfect for orc forming. The powered armor also further enhanced each orc's strength, and was flexible enough to expand as the orc expanded. Each soldier orc was first forced to fight against hundreds of its peers inside the war hulks, and this swelled each beast to vast scales. Most were taller than even an Astartes warrior when they were finally allowed to construct their armor and weaponry, which each and every orc instinctive knew how to build, unconsciously building their gear according to the exact specifications of higher authority, tailoring their weaponry to be optimized for whatever battlefield they found themselves on. Though the unseen brain boys of the numerous hosts were never seen on the battlefield, powerful war bosses led the armies of each hulk, and were brilliant tacticians, as their size naturally made them more intelligent, each war making them more efficient and more intelligent. Each hulk, though separated by light years, had some means of psychic communication with their fellow hulks, due to either the psychic might of the brain boys, or their manipulation of sicker orcs placed upon modified warp reading thrones as a form of telepathic network. Needless to say, these croak hosts spread quickly, and created numerous huge empires. The thirsting blood knights of Baal were fought to a standstill around the Duralian warp gate by the croak, denied their prize of a whole world of mortals which they could taint and then drain to stave off the black rage. A task force comprising of two whole commanderies had to be deployed to drive off an armada of croak who had managed to cripple the logistical supplies of dozens of Vulcan systems. That war was known as the War of Renewed Vengeance. 
and eventually the forces of Vulcan only after the sacrifice of the legendary hero Lord Captain Hexatrin of the Silent Panther's commandery prevailed, but the Krok could not be finally defeated, as they divided their fleet and began a guerrilla campaign which lasted for 500 years. Numerous battles and wars were found against Krok's across the western and eastern Chaos Imperiums, and both factions lost dozens of worlds to the disciplined invaders. Abaddon managed to defeat a Krok force by utilizing the planet killer's awesome firepower to destroy a war hulk, which seemed to be the only method of permanently crippling a Krok armada. The Krok had a surprisingly special hatred for their feral brethren, and often accelerated asteroids into planets they were on, or made a special effort to exterminate the entire population of feral greenskins on the ground, before burning the mountains of corpses. The Krok were a menace to all factions, for they seem to have declared themselves to be a war against all elements of the galaxy. From the Starfather's Dreadangle worlds, to the blasted ruins of the Shatter Wake and their bone feeders, the Krok were fearsome opponents. In particular, they seemed to lose some of their cold demeanor when fighting the Necrons. On some instinctual level, they knew what their eldritch function was, for it was encoded into every fiber of their green, war-forged, flesh. Their faith is unknown. All that the world at large could decipher of their brutal, complex language spoke of awaiting the two, the facets of the god mount. Some claimed, in those early years, that they were merely referring to their primitive ancestor gods, Gork and Mork. Alas, if only it had been that simple. The true relevance of their creed would not become evident until it was too late to stop what had been started. But that conflict shall be documented in a later section, once these chronicles have been properly reinforced to withstand the telling of the tale of the next. File corrupted. Loading backup files. Additional background section 6 The Despoiler's Domain. For 10,000 years, the Despoiler had spread across the entirety of Segmentum Obscurus, breaking each system in turn with his vast fleets of chaotic beasts and loyal minions. Endless regiments of the Dark Cadians known as the Despoiled marched under the dark banners of Cleaved Aquila, and murdered those who opposed the Chaos Emperor ruthlessly. Leading these vast armies were the Black Legion, who formed a diamond hard center to the Great Despoiler's regime. Abaddon forged a new empire from the splintered marrow of ruined Imperial Domains and Xenos Empire, crushing each in turn and forcing their broken populations to kneel before him and his diabolic forces. Many did so willingly, for those the Despoiler was a butcher and a madman. He wished to rule a powerful and unified Imperium of Darkness. Rather than a shattered ruin of roving warbands and screeching devil spawn, Agri worlds were enhanced by warp-tainted contagions that infested their crops and their forests, forming great tangled masses of man-eating mangroves across thousands upon thousands of miles. Captured forge worlds and enslaved hive worlds churned out towering demon engines of ever more grandiose and insane designs, concocted by the dark mechanicus of the putrid poisoned worlds of lathe and their vassal forges. In some of the more vile and odious hives, those who toiled in their factories barely registered that the Imperium of old had ever gone. Yet, to maintain the great western Imperium required constant warfare and cruel reprisals, for many and powerful were the supposed vassals of the Despoiler. Con the Betrayer was a constant irritation to the Dark Lord, smashing apart worlds at random as he howled his frustration into the void. Abaddon and his allied forces engaged warbands associated with Khan over a hundred times throughout 273 M52, and during the Great Uprising of M55. Lord Elveniel of the Screamers a warband of fallen iron knights who owed feudal obligation to the Dark Lord were almost constantly in pursuit of the betrayer's charnel barge and those craze, vessels full of madmen who pursued him like hungry hounds lapping at the frothing or left in his wake. Alveniel was finally brutally butchered during the siege of Mordia, by Khan himself who rammed his brass fanged battleship straight through Alveniel's grand cruiser. The word bearers, who had at first allied with the despoiler, had gained much influence and power over the millennia and their hellish demon worlds were the largest and most fearsome in the Isle of Terror, some claimed. The word bearers were useful to Abaddon as orators and enforcers of the profane creeds of the desperate factions of the Chaos Imperium. No consensus could ever be reached between all the various insane demagogues and slabbering monsters that dwelt within the deep pits of these worlds, or ruled from obsidian thrones like Dark Heralds. But nevertheless the word bearers made sure that unrest and insurrection remained a localized affair. Abaddon encouraged coups and bloody uprisings, as long as they were never against himself. Altar ships full of dark apostles and their familiars roamed the void between enslaved worlds of the Chaos Imperium, preaching and summoning demons into reality as they passed by. 
A button expressly forbade the word bearers his dark star-shaped vessels to enter the systems of any of his major power bases, on fear of unmaking in the great swirling heart of barbarity. Barbarity was a demon ship which had crashed into a star and poisoned it, turning it a vile green. Anything which fell into the warp plasma vortex was utterly destroyed. Body, essence and soul. In 173M53, the despoiled, alongside a veritable tide of mercenaries and mutants and fallen astarts, conquered the Kuol Swarmhood. The final siege of their honeycombed homeworlds was performed by the great spider-like demon King's Exes, another of the deep warp demons a brother of Volchoch the Maker. The titanic spider's hulking form toppled the towering funnels of the Swarmhood to the ground and the capering demons and mad humans who flooded the world in his wake overwhelmed the insectoid empire after a bitter campaign of destruction, which cost billions of lives on both sides. It ended when their queen was captured, and infected with warp-tainted blood. These plague flooded her systems and internal juices, and the pheromone stench which allowed her to enthrall her drones turned the entire realm into an eager ally of the western chaos imperial. On the moon of Threnbane, a sicker fraternity had spun a worldwide tapestry from psychic threads. Without the Imperium, they had flourished, and their seers had constructed this great warp-empowered edifice, which they used to divine the future strands of history like some great humming orchestra. Such rippling waves of psychic energy soon attracted the attentions of the Despoiler and his cohorts, for Abaddon very much desired to learn of his own fate in the destiny of the universe. However, a great fleet of iron warriors fell upon the world, in alliance with the beasts of annihilation, creatures bound to Angron. The iron warriors determined to deny Abaddon his desires, in vengeance for his defeat of their Primarch many thousands of years ago. They fell upon the witch world like grim mechanisms of steel and hate, burning and gunning down all they could find with pitiless cruelty. Threads were severed, and settlements blasted into blackened craters. Their warsmith, a villain known as Kavim, smirked humorlessly as he destroyed Abaddon's new toy. By the time Abaddon arrived with his fleet, almost every thread of the world weave was ruined, and the Iron Warriors were fully entrenched in their grand bastions. Impervious to orbital or ground assault, and patrolled by the frothing mongrel warhounds of Angron. The siege nevertheless lasted only a few days. This was because Abaddon, in his paranoid wisdom, had installed numerous mercenary Calidus assassins and Alpha Legion infiltrators amongst the population of Threnbane. On his command, they unleashed Life Eater capsules inside the shielded Iron Warrior Bastions. Contained inside the Void Shielding, the virus did no harm to Abaddon's landing forces. However, battle was soon joined on the ground as the Beasts of Annihilation charged into the fray with infinite fury, their possessed marines ignoring tempests of weapons fire and blades to reach the Despoiled's lines. The Dark Lord personally carved his way through masses of half-demons and freakishly mutated astarts as he made his way through the dense foliage of fallen threads. Finally, he reached the final enclave of Sicker Monks, and their last functioning seer loom. Before he destroyed them, he demanded to know his future. No one knows what prophecy they imparted to the Chaos Emperor, but soon after he massacred them all, and bombed their world into dust, before the planet Killer destroyed it utterly. Demonic agents, Lassimol, Calidus fiends and other shadowy agents employed by Abaddon were later instructed to scour the Chaos Imperium for good, honest men, whom they were to eliminate with maximum misery and pain inflicted upon them. Some say the monks told Abaddon who it was that would finally kill him, while others claim they merely revealed to him the final piece of the great engine of destiny which was guiding the galaxy to some great climax. Whatever it was, Abaddon grew obsessed with altering the outcome foretold in the legends. If the prophecy was indeed related to his death, he perhaps had cause for alarm, for he had narrowly avoided death on several occasions. The closest the despoiler came to being destroyed was during the siege of the Nemesis Vault, an inquisitional fortress located on the borders of his expanding empire. The fortress was one of the most formidable of its kind, and had been held in a planetary stasis field for almost 20,000 years when Abaddon finally disturbed the relic of the old Imperia. The highly advanced world boasted a full Titan Legion, many Death Watch kill teams, 10 regiments of Inquisitorial Stormtroopers. Sororitas convents and a full squad of Grey Knights one of the few contingents of Grey Knights who were not trapped upon the unbreakable fortress of Titan, at the heart of the Void Dragon's prison. The Great Bastion contained many dark and forbidden artifacts held under lock and key forever. The Despoiler and his allies desired them, and he persuaded many hundreds of divergent chaos factions to fall upon the world. Ram-faced beastmen and tides of mutants from the Brotherhood of the Fowl, the towering demon knights of Securalan, hundreds of vampire covens of possessed monsters, 
a billion strong force of plague zombies shipped into combat by death guard under the silent glare of typhus, half beetle barbarian mutants and shifilid swarms. War machines and hell engines of the lathe, relictors, dragon warriors, Cole Barder and his personal army. And finally the grand imperial army of the despoiled and its subordinate legions of twisted mortal soldiers. The skies burned and the walls ran molten, as these great forces all bombarded and invaded as one discordant mass. Abaddon tried to force some order upon them, but chaos is as chaos does, and it was utter anarchy. This, ironically, played to the strengths of the Inquisitor Lord who commanded the vaults, for the warbands began to fight each other as much as the defender. In an effort to bring order to the madness, the despoiler brought the vengeful spirit closer to the world, as a visual symbol of his continuing presence. This was an error. As soon as his ship entered low orbit, the last of the defense lasers simultaneously pounded the vessel, knocking down its shields for 5 seconds, before they recharged. This was all that was required, for in that instant, the Grey Knights teleported aboard, they struck the reactors first, and the Black Legion stationed there barely managed to prevent them sending the engine critical. Nevertheless, the generators lost power, much to Abaddon's fury, gathering his most fearsome chosen around him, he rushed to butcher the fools who thought to deny him his prize. The Grey Knights were waiting, and ten gleaming terminators fell upon the huge tusk chosen and the despoiled who rushed to aid them. The leader of the Grey Knights was a thing of epic legends, brother Captain Stern, long thought lost, towered before Abaddon, clad in a vast dread knight fighting suit. Abaddon's champion, the demon prince Belfrock, brayed in loathing and dread as he threw himself into combat with the hulking war machine and its holy occupant. Two giants clashed in the light cast by a dying plasma reactor, demon claws against four sword, kai gun against a cannon, fencing became wrestling, became frantic clawing and punching. At last, Stern broke the prince in two with a single vast sweep of his four sword, before obliterating the body with bolts of psychic lightning which fled from his eyes like a holy beacon. Abaddon recoiled from the towering silver god of war, who bellowed the 666 litanies as he proceeded to aid in the slaughter of the rest of the chosen. Abaddon fought alone now, slaying each terminator with ever increasing difficulty. His demonic runes fled in protest and his sword churned with hate and terror as it felt the holocaust building. Your world is dead, failed bastard of my father's loin. Your imperium toppled into the abyss. You are alone in this galaxy. You are nothing now Abaddon defiantly screamed, as he prepared to fight his final battle. A cannon bolt blasted his helmet from his shoulders, and snapped his head backwards, unleashing his extravagant top knot from the barbed braid at the top of his skull. Blood frothed from his mouth, and he fell backwards roughly. Stern advanced, smiling grimly as he removed his helmet. My brothers survive in me. The Emperor is avenged in me. The bastard of Horus is punished by me he howled, raising his blade high. A LAS bolt struck his uncovered head. And another, followed by another, Stern's head was ruptured by the searing blasts, and his concentration was lost. In his dying flourish, a great blast of white light erupted from Stern as his dread knight simply toppled to the floor. The psychic backlash stunned the terminators, and the demons bound within the vengeful spirit took this chance to vanquish their hated foes. Tendrils and oily monstrous sphincters closed upon the defiant knights, who died fighting one and all. Abaddon rose from the ground, and turned to observe a quivering despoiled soldier, who lowered his smoking lasgan unsteadily. Abaddon, for the first time in many centuries, cracked a sinister smile. It is said that when on the field of battle, Abaddon is now accompanied by a towering dread knight, bound and deconsecrated by the greatest of dark mechanicus, and piloted by a mortal man, bound into the machine by disciples of Baal in such a way that every death inflicted by the knight sends a shiver of pure pleasure into the spinal cord of the loyal dark Cadian. A grandiose and disgusting reward for saving the Dark Lord's life. The Nemesis Vault was breached after half a decade of furious siege. The defenders were defeated after most of them starved to death, or were poisoned by the plagues and noisome elixirs of typhus that cleared them out or turned them into shambling monsters. The artifacts within were fought over by the assembled forces, and a furious naval engagement ensued. Some say the greatest artifact in the vault wasn't a chaos item at all, but rather some great Xenos blade, which vanished as soon as the stasis field was lowered. Others say it was stolen by agents for the Heracles cult or the Sons of Magnus. None can be sure, the Chaos Imperium found first from without as well as within. Angle worlds began to form in some areas, and specially bred new men, bound with demons and weapons of profanity, were sent to cleanse these worlds and banish their Archangels. 
These elite possessed warbands were known as the Blasphematii, and modeled themselves in ironic mockery of the almost extinct Grey Knight Order. Not only this, but the Vulcan Imperium and Huron Black Hearts mongrels pressed against his border regions. And, with almost unnoticeable progress, the seals around Sulla began to loosen, like the old threads in a tarred rope. The worst of Abaddon's foes remained an elusive element for many millennia however. The Alpha Wolfen and its frenzied inhuman Fenrica who followed the beast destroyed armies and butchered worlds at the heart of the Eye of Terror. And seemed to expand their influence once Abaddon left the Eye, as if pursuing him and his forces. All efforts to hunt down this unseen beast had ended in failure, and those Malatek stalkers and assassins sent after the Wolfen King never returned. It was claimed to be some sort of old demon from the Eye, summoned and bound by Lorga to unnerve Abaddon. However, the truth came some time later, when the threads of eternity pulled more tightly together, and the true conflict became disturbingly apparent. Additional Background Section 7 The Dread Marshal and the Tide of Wrath In the name of nothing, I purge you and this whole world, for it is good. It is very good. Time to burn. Time to pray. Hope your heathen gods are listening, otherwise, this'll be quick. Recording degenerates into uncontrollable bitter laughter. Last audible transmission received by the unarmed agri world of Fensidal, hours before being invaded and razed to the ground. 20,000 years is too long for a crusade of punishment, yet still the crusade of the High Marshal of the Black Templars continued. Even as new warp gods rose and fell in the firmament, the Templars continued to purge world after world, converting or destroying every planet they could reach. For countless centuries the grief-maddened Templars degenerated and slaughtered. They recruited more and more eager and insane converts into their furiously propagated faith. They preached a creed of self-mortification, punishment and eventual death, for the Emperor was dead, and the world would know of this fact through pain. Such nihilism numbed them to their own casual heresies. They converted any Astartes who willingly joined them. Night Lords, amused by their terror tactics, threw in their lot with the maddened monk knights, as did men of desperate sororitas and a great multitude of foolish men from across a thousand worlds. Sons of Malice fought with them joined the crusade in their own paradoxical glee, and the agents of the Hydra found it pathetically easy to infiltrate the crazed warriors. The Templars were no more. They embraced their own self-destruction, and the distinction between man, a starts and blood mad butcher dissolved in the melting cauldron of war. This was the crusade of madness. They increasingly referred to each other as Oblivionites, agents of sweet annihilation, for only in destruction on the battlefield, surrounded by thousands of slain foes, could they find peace. Chains and fire was their legacy. Populations were bound in chains, alike and screaming in misery across the Oblivionite vehicles and ships. Their artificers crafted warped and bizarre dark armor that molded to the forms of the Crusaders. Armor that coiled about them like disgusting bleeding vines, which merge with their chains and braziers. Oblivionite initiates and serfs had wailing sirens stitched into their throats, that bled old imperial hymns. Horribly distorted and modulated until all that could be made out was the underlying hate that fed the Vox Halers. Immolator tanks and Crusader land raiders pulverized settlements and ruined lives on the whims of this crazed order. Some of the more insane and formidable Oblivionites had their limbs elongated and bonded to blades and pincers and serrated flails. With cyclone launchers that flung hate speech and frothing oil as frequently as crack missiles. These were known as the Langemensch, and where they fell nothing lived, even themselves. The Eternal Crusader expanded with each passing year, as did many of the barges that followed in its wake, expanding to accommodate more prisons and churches filled with spinning blades and grinding drills where pious men would fling themselves into the churning mass of metal, and their fleshy pulp was then sprayed over new recruits through thick hoses. The Oblivionites were led by the former High Marshal Canaan, who became known as the Dread Marshal. He was bound within a dreadnought sarcophagus. Some claimed it was this that drove him mad, and contributed to the rapid degeneration of the Crusaders. Others claimed the turbulent warp was to blame for their madness. Its conflict between the Starfather and the other powers warping the minds of the Astartes, who were both furious figures of hate and adherents of Imperial domination, which split their minds into things of shattered glass and deluded perception. Kanan dwelt within the Eternal Crusader almost exclusively, conversing with shadowy figures who shifted in the gloom of his reclusium. Chaplains brought adherents to his chambers every month, and these quivering men were rarely seen again alive. Those who left his chambers were dark-eyed and crazed, spouting philosophical nonsense as they calmly carved their names on the faces of their friends, or opened their locks and jumped out. The only thing they all ranted about equally was a singular word, malice. 
Dark pennons could sometimes be glimpsed on the battlements, flashes of shadowy shapes on the periphery of vision. The Oblivionites terrorized the galactic north in a wide arc, which infringed upon both chaos empires, bordered the conflict in the east, and even affected the outer territories of the Vulcan Imperium. They were narrowly driven from the Rizzo Catagen Alliance's sector, after repeated raids by the cybernetically enhanced Catagen Plasma Commandos. However, in most cases, the worlds they invaded were woefully unprepared for the enemy who descended upon them. Even if prepared, the mercenary armies of private worlds often deserted rather than risk themselves fighting mad superhumans. Even the few remaining free companies were reluctant to waste resources fighting such monstrously destructive foes. Worlds would surrender pitifully, and their people would suffer for it, hunted in the streets, and burned from orbit, or taken and indoctrinated in a creed which compelled them to murder everyone they loved. Men suffered and died in great masses. The Oblivionites would then erect titanic monuments on each world they converted. Mile-high statues built from filth and the wreckage of smashed cities, which proclaimed the Crusaders' own glorious disregard for everything and everyone in existence. Valhalla was not such a world. When the Oblivionites burst into their system, their system defense fleet immediately charged to attack the incoming obsidian vessels. Initiating a vast naval battle which lasted for almost a month before the SDF were eliminated. This bought the Valhallans time. Distress signals were hopelessly flung out into the void. Trenches were dug. Supply lines and armories were stocked and prepared. The draft saw almost every man and woman not employed in factory work thrust into the military. Orvek Chenkov, the Grand Dictator of Valhalla and a distant descendant of the infamous M41 colonel that shared his last name, would not accept invasion or subjugation. Valhalla had weathered the second age of strife in the decade of a thousand invasions from 234 M53-244 M53. They would not bow or prostrate themselves before nihilistic psychopaths. Valhalla would endure, always. The massive icy cities of the Valhallan, built into mountainsides or beneath mile-thick ice sheets, were ever more fortified. Seven armored companies were stationed outside the city of Invenka, where the towering gold dome of St. Siophus rose majestically atop a volcanic ridge that jutted from beneath a glacier. Surf soldiers of Krieg were placed in the most hazardous and inhospitable areas. Militias bearing the banners of their cities flooded the training barracks and their million. All leave from factories was revoked, a worker worked 22 hours a day producing war material for stockpiling. It was said that there was an ammo dump on every street corner, and even the children had auto pistols tucked in their belts. On the evening beginning 284.399 M54, orbital bombardment began with a fire storm of fearsome scale, followed by kinetic barrages of kill rods and heavy macro cannons. The very tectonic plates themselves shuddered with the force of the assault. Earthquakes and fires erupted across Valhalla, but the forces simply dug themselves in. Defense lasers stitched flaming patterns in the heavens, and wounded the sky until it seemed to ripple red with the onslaught. Torpedo silos embedded in cliff faces dueled with the enemy vessels also, hurling munitions the size of castle turrets towards the void-bound foe. Heedless of risk, many of the smaller Oblivionite vessels were struck and crashed onto the surface like city-sized meteorites. Mushroom clouds of plasma fire scorched the glaciers, and great rolling banks of nuclear steam, that boiled thousands of conscripts and surf soldiers as they ran for cover. Soon after, the drop pods came, plunging through the fire and fury and punching holes through the glacial ablative armor which protected the cities. The ice confounded several pods, trapping them halfway between the sky and the crust in frozen tombs. Heavy weapon teams soon destroyed those immobilized invaders with their cannons and missile pods. Others however, penetrated the ice and struck like lightning swift daggers at the heart of cities. Superhumans stormed bastions and charged through the streets with furious abandon. Their physical perfection and murderous might overcame the discipline and bloody mindedness of the defenders, and they were forced on the back foot throughout. Meanwhile, on the surface, the conscript armies in their countless millions clashed against the human oblivionite neophytes who swarmed from their large-bellied landing craft, while thunderhawks covered with chained, wailing prisoners strafed the human waves of gun fodder, and delivered more astarts into the fray, but the skies were contested. Valkyries and vendettas also blasted the invaders, while marauder bombers dropped thousands of tons of high explosive across the blood-drenched glaciers. The surf soldiers showed their worth, demonstrating utter fearlessness in the face of battle. Those who died made sure to kill their slayer, or at least encumber the enemy enough to allow their vat-born brothers to finish them off. 
basilisks and even larger fixed artillery positions cast an endless deluge of ordnance into the fray, and continued firing even when their defenders desperately tried to fend off strike teams of Night Lord Oblivion Knights, who crawled down the cliffs like spiders to reach them. The Oblivion Knights were post-human gods at war, bred to destroy, and backed by legions of zealots and gigatons of ordnance. But they faced an entire world of Valhalla soldiery, entrenched with an armory which could last for months. The war drew on, and Valhalla soon became a world of crumbling icy slush, jagged mountain fangs all surrounded by oceans made from the melted remains of the ice world's crust of permafrost. The ice world became a waterlogged nightmare. Battles raged through the catacombs and sewers. Artillery dueled from the peaks of opposing mountain. The tank battalions clashed with the predators and raiders of the Oblivionite Crusade and the shadow of the glorious Golden Dome, which was soon smashed into glittering shards amidst the fury of exchanged ordnance. Every week the war dragged on, more commanders began to question Chunkov's attrition-based approach. Every week, more and more commanders were executed, and more and more soldiers were drafted to face off against the might of the vast crusade force of the Dread Marshal. The factories began to use up the stocks of adamantine and promethium which had been gathered the previous year from nearby trading world. Valhalla was being bled dry, and still the mad astarts poured all their fury and self-destructive hate into the war, which had spread to the other planets in the system, which each fell one by one, until Valhalla was all that was left. Newly deranged converts to the Oblivion cult flocked to Valhalla from the other planets, eager to die in the fires of warfare. Chenkov obliged of course. There were so many waterlogged corpses upon Valhalla, which they formed vast battlements of dead that stretched for miles around each city. After a year of grueling sieges and desperate battles fought in the shallow warborn oceans, the Dread Marshal's heralds began to address the world on an open vox, carrying across the system to every commander that could receive such signals. It was a voice of cruel mockery and merciless intent. The heralds screamed from their fleet ships. We shall carve you into bloodied ribbons of flesh, and pound your world to dust. The Emperor's sight has been put out, and deviancy reigns in its stead. There is no guiding astronomical beacon. We are alone in the dark. You shall die here, and you shall welcome it. Oblivion has come to your world. We feast upon your flesh tribute, and we grow strong from this destruction, while you grow weaker. Offer your bodies, your flesh, unto the wardship of the Herald of the End, and he will ensure its passage is a swift and glorious one. With your flesh and your strength, we may put out the eyes of man's foes, and gain apotheosis and degradation. The flesh is strong, and you can be strong. Before the defenders could reply, another message cut into the transmission. It was a harsh, metallic tone. Nay, heathen dog, the flesh is weak. Lord Vulcan sends his regards, the Iron Hands Force commander responded bluntly, as his vessels emerged from interstellar space, where they had lain in wait for a year, slowly re-entering the system under minimal power. The perfect sneak attack. Chenkov had never intended victory over the Oblivionites. Chenkov's strategy had been one of containment, he had been ordered to keep the focus of the Crusaders upon Valhalla, and to ensure that all the Oblivionites converged upon the system. He had been ruthless in his acceptance of this plan, and the sacrifice of his people to achieve it. He had known they would suffer, and he cared not, a legacy of his ancestors' bloodline. Apparently Chenkov died in his sleep shortly after the liberation of the ruined Valhalla. The Dread Marshal's fleet was caught off guard by the Iron Hands and their cold metal vessels that soon shuddered to life and unleashed hell on the twisted astarts. Battle barges and cruisers dueled in the heavens at colossal distances, and ships burst apart like stricken whales in the deep, spewing fiery viscera from mechanical bowels. Yet, for all their joyless mechanical power, the Iron Hands could not contain the Eternal Crusader. Battered and bloody, it fought its way clear, almost breaking the Iron Hands fleet on its own. The Iron Hands commandery master, Mergen, managed to destroy the Crusader's warp drive, and forced it to flee into the void itself. Wounded but still very much armed, the Crusader was harried from the system. Yet, the Iron Hands could not sustain any mere losses in pursuing the stricken craft any further. They left that seemingly banal mission to the Fire Beasts, who translated into the system alongside the Purple Vipers and Heartrando Space Marine Commanderies to mop up the surviving Crusaders. When the Fire Beasts finally caught up with the Crusader, it was running on minimal power. Hoping to capture the vessel for Vulcan as the Primarch had done with Phalanx during the Battle of Falling Skies a century before, the Fire Beasts eagerly boarded the vessel. 
What happened on board the Eternal Crusader is a mystery, but many hours later, the Astartes left the ship, and bombarded it until it collapsed upon itself and was finally wrecked. The Fire Beasts rarely speak of what occurred inside the vessel. All that is known is that they lost almost 200 marines inside. All they say when explaining what happened there is a simple phrase, Malice has seen the wheel behind the world, and that is all they ever say in reference to that dark day. The day the Black Templars were put down. It took several dozen disgruntled soldiers, 14 rounds of a heavy stubber, an overdose of trank, a vial of neurotoxin, a hatchet and three bayonets to make sure he died in his sleep, but eventually he did. The legend of Chenkov's death subsequently did get amplified in the telling, but his remains suggest at least the stubber shots were accurate. So I've recently moved Nick Badia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. So I am an affiliate of NordVPN. If you have been thinking of getting a VPN with everything going on at the minute NordVPN is offering 75% off a 3 year plan. I have been using Nor myself for a few years now because it helps support a lot of the people I like to watch on YouTube and I think it's pretty cool they have let me become an affiliate. So check out norvpn.org forward slash nickbeardier and use coupon code nickbeardier for 75% off while the offer is on.